I'm Zella King. I'm a health data scientist at the Clinical Operational Research Unit at University College London, and I'm an embedded researcher at University College London Hospitals Trust, or UCLH. And this webinar is hosted by the NHSR community. I'm going to talk about how to turn your hospital's electronic health record data into predictions of emergency demand for beds. This is work that we've done at UCLH. We have a real-time application generating predictions over the next eight hours of incoming demand. And I want to share what we've done in case this might be helpful for you. So the idea of this webinar will give you some insight into what data you could use to do this kind of modeling in your hospital, how to transform your data into a structure suitable for predictions of short-term demand, some high level introduction to the modeling steps involved, some information about how we have made our demand predictions aspirational to reflect the four hour targets for emergency departments and some thoughts on how you might evaluate model performance. Let's start with some background about the setting at UCLH and the people we've designed these models for. So our users are bed managers. They are senior nurses who plan and manage hospital capacity and allocate beds to patients. They have a stressful job where they have to make difficult decisions, especially when the hospitals are full and capacity is under pressure because they have to decide when to call that patient care is no longer safe. So having accurate predictions of incoming demand is a really useful input into that decision-making process. So what I'm presenting here very much reflects the needs of those particular bed managers at UCLH. In order to coordinate this thinking about capacity, they have specific times of day when they have so-called flow huddles, where they review incoming demand and outgoing patients, and then consider the state of the hospital and send out capacity reports. They would ideally have a rolling eight hour view of incoming demand at these times, rather than a view up each day up to midnight, which is what's commonly done. And when you're having a rolling eight hour demand, you need also to think about not only the patients in the emergency department now, but also the ones yet to arrive. So in a sense, we've got to think about two models. In our eight hour rolling window, who's in now? What do we know about them? How many beds do we think they will need? And then who might we expect to arrive and be admitted in the next eight hours? They also are more interested in overall bed numbers than they are in whether any individual patient might be admitted. And ideally they'd have those overall bed numbers broken down by specialty of admission, medical, surgical beds, etc. Because that is more actionable information than when you have it at the hospital level as a whole. They use email and spreadsheets for communication. And so recognising that the output that we send is in the form of a spreadsheet and it is sent to them by email. So you can see here the output that our application currently generates. You can see an area where we've got a breakdown by specialty. We separate out the patients they already know about, those who have a decision to admit already in columns B and C by specialty. Then we have in columns D and E a predicted minimum number of initial beds they're going to need in the next eight hours for patients currently in the department. And then in columns F and G, the predicted minimum number of beds they're going to need for patients yet to arrive. And in this talk, I'm going to explain each of these elements in more detail. I'm going to give you some terminology to help us along. So I'm going to talk about prediction moments, which is the moment in the day when a prediction is to be made. That's those, those five, five times in the day that I showed before. And then I'm going to talk about, about the arrivals and the predictions within the window, the prediction window, after the prediction moment, which in our case is eight hours. And as I've already said, we're going to need two models, one thinking about those patients who we have electronic health record data about, and then one about those who have not yet arrived but will be admitted. I want to speak a bit about the data structure for this kind of modelling. So a typical electronic health record has a data warehouse and it would normally have the data structured like this in a relational database form. So you'd have separate tables for patient information, then a table for each hospital visit by patient. You can see here that I've got one patient who had two visits. Uh, and then within a visit, you might have further breakdown of, say, for example, the location history of that patient during that visit. And you can see there, there are timestamps demarcating exactly when that patient visited each location. 
So we can reconfigure that data into a chronological view of a, of a visit. So here I've got the patient 101, who the visit, who he arrives at four o'clock in the morning and is discharged um, around two in the afternoon. And then the second patient arrives uh, one thirty and is, is discharged around five. And we can see that at, uh, say, at six o'clock in the morning, we knew that patient 101 was in the rapid triage area. Um, and then later in the, in the progression of their visit, we would then also know that they had visited the majors area. So these are kind of useful indications of what is going to happen at the end of the visit, because if a patient visits majors, they're more likely to be admitted than if they visit the urgent treatment centre or the minors area of the emergency department. When we're thinking about how to predict demand from these patients, we need to take a snapshot of the visit as if it hasn't ended. So imagine rolling through this data in a, in a cycle where you take your five prediction times in the day, I've shown them here, 6 a.m., 9.30 a.m., midday, etc. And then you take a snapshot of what do we know about this patient at that moment in time. And that's the way that we sort of artificially recreate a real-time view of a visit from retrospective data. And we can use the timestamps that are captured in the electronic health record to give us that view. And from that, we can derive what, what I'm calling here a snapshot. So as it happens, we observe that first visit three times. So we've got three snapshots for that visit. And then we observe the second one once we have one snapshot for that visit. Just one other thing about good practice in modeling. It's common to separate out the data into what's called a training set and sometimes called a holdout set or a test set to evaluate the data. We've done this chronologically. So we take the first 70% of snapshots as our training set and the, the most recent 20% as our test set. And that kind of mirrors the real situation after deployment. When you train a model, you would deploy it typically later in time. So doing it this in this chronological manner allows you to consider whether you're experiencing some kind of drift in any of the variables between the training set and the test set. We also anonymize the data. Um, some of the data I'm going to show you is real patient data, but we've done a few things to ensure that there is minimum likelihood of re-identification. Re so all the dates have been shifted forward in time into the future by a whole number of weeks. So the pattern of visits over the days of the week is consistent, but it's all pushed into the future. Age has been grouped into bands here, and we have removed data from vulnerable patients and those in very minority categories, since that might um, permit re-identification. So let's start with the model for the patients in the emergency department. There are essentially three steps involved in the way we do this. So the first step is to model each patient's probability of admission, given what we know about them at the point of time when we observe them. Then we consider that if they're admitted, what is their probability of admission to any given specialty? And then thirdly, we aggregate these to create a probability distribution that will allow us to kind of take this aggregate view and derive the numbers in the spreadsheet that you can see here. So starting off with step one, we want a probability of admission for each patient given what we know about them at that time. Remember, we've got our data structured into snapshots, so we're going to want a probability for each snapshot. And we're going to use um, class a machine learning classifier from XGBoost to do this. That, like all machine learning models, learns from a series of predictor variables and a label and then assigns to each observation or snapshot in our case a probability that that particular visit would have the outcome of interest which in our case is the outcome of admission. And we'll see here that we've got in this uh, fictional data we obviously have some visits um, reoccurring more than once as I already said but we also have uh, multiple times of day when we observe the visits and we actually train a model separately for each time of day because the the nature of the presentations at each time of day may be somewhat different. At 6 a.m., we're more likely to have patients who have stayed in all night waiting for admission to beds, for example. Uh, at midday, we're more likely to have patients who are in for minors or sort of urgent treatment type care, but are less likely to be admitted. So we, as we have plenty of data, we took the decision to train one model for each time of day that we're interested in. When you use um, classifier like 
XG Boost, one of the nice things is that you can interrogate the features it's using to generate its predictions. And I've shown here two charts. The one on the left shows the feature importances. I've just shown the top five. And then the one on the right shows what's called a SHAP plot. I'm not going to give the detail of the variables here. It's just really to give you a sense of the fact that you can look at which variables a model is picking on to make its predictions. So the left, left chart is showing us which variables are most important and most frequently used in the decision tree model used by XGBoost. And then the right one shows how for the test set observations, whether any given feature pushed the probability more towards more likely admission or more likely discharge. I've just highlighted one example feature here, which is whether the patient currently is in the urgent treatment center. That's the minors area of the emergency department. And you can see it's the fifth most important feature. So it's used uh, a lot in the decision tree structure of XGBoost. And on the right hand side, you can see that if someone is in the urgent treatment center, that gives them a lower probability admission, which is what we'd expect because as a, as a pathway, people are not meant to be admitted after visiting the urgent treatment center. So we, now we can think about one of our snapshots and we can take a, a view of the emergency department at that point in time. Here I've shown the dots as their kind of chronological, how long have they been here? Their elapsed time. And then I split them simply into three pathways. Those who are in majors recess, those who are in minors, and those who are in other locations. And I should also add that we're including the same day emergency care stream in this data. So it's both the emergency department and the same day emergency care stream. So we can see that the, the visits are building up um, over time and we can apply our XGBoost model to them to give each one a probability of admission. And here, this is a nice kind of face validity check for are we, do we think the model is doing something we would expect? And you can see that in the majors and resus stream, there are a whole bunch of patients with quite a high probability of admission, whereas in the minors stream, there are, there are barely any. Uh, so that is consistent with the expectations of those different signals indicating admission. So the next step is to model the probability of admission. If someone is admitted, which specialty are they going to be admitted to? And the way we do this at UCLH is we use four quite crude groupings, at least I am in this, in this demonstration, medicine, surgery, haematology, oncology, or pediatric specialties. And we're going to use some information that is, again, accumulated during the sequence of a patient stay. That is a request for a consultation with an inpatient specialist who is asked to come to the emergency department to agree to admit that patient to their care. So you have a consultation request issued, and we can see that in the data, and a patient may have more than one. So it's possible they could have a sequence of them. And we want to know what that sequence is at the point of time that we observe them at an incomplete moment in the visit. And then at some point, that sequence is going to end in the final end of visit sequence. So we call that the final sequence. And we're going to do a mapping of that sequence to their probability of admission to any of the specialties. So if you imagine uh, they might have had a medical sequence at the time that we, uh, sorry, a medical consult at the time that we observe them, that will then map to a final sequence at the end of the visit, which could be medical, or maybe they had an, uh, then a follow on with an elderly uh, team, or perhaps they had a following on consult request with the surgical team. And depending on if they have surgical after medical, that's going to f uh, change their probability of admission to the eventual specialty, as you can see on the right. It's also possible that we might observe them prior to them having any consults, but we can still map those visits where no consult request has been, been made yet to a final sequence and thereby to ending in a given specialty. And we're using a probabilistic model like this, we can assign a, at any observed moment, we can say what we think a patient's probability is of being admitted to each of the four specialties. I'm just showing here the probability of admission to a medical specialty. And you can see a couple of patients in the majors resus stream who have more heavily marked dots. So they've obviously had a medical consult and models, uh, the prob probability is therefore greater that they will be admitted to medicine. And you can see some very pale dots where patients have had probably another type of, of consult like a surgical or a hematology consult, which will reduce their probability of being admitted to medical. 
So those two things give us uh, the probability of admission and the probability of admission to a given specialty. The next step is to aggregate these to create a probability distribution. So we're interested in the overall number of beds to expect. And we want to give some sense of the uncertainty around that probability. So if you consider this uh, bar chart here, on this particular moment, on this snapshot, the expected number of beds, the most likely number of beds is nine because that's the tallest bar. But you can see the spread around it. So it gives more of a sense of how confident are we in that nine. If the bars were very flat, then we would know that we were not very confident of the nine. But if there's a nice peak, then that gives you a sense of nine is the most likely number. Um, and we can read off that spread to give a sense of what's the minimum number of beds that the hospital is going to need, given what we know about these patients. And we present that back in the spreadsheet. So we show the bed managers, well, there's a 90% probability that you're going to need at least six beds. And then there's a 70% probability that you're going to need at least seven beds. So it gives them some sense of what's the best case they could hope for, given the current makeup of, pa of patients in the emergency department. So that gives us those numbers that you can see there on the line for medicine. We can see six patients with 90% probability and seven patients with 70% probability. Now, if we were to think about this over an eight hour period, we need to decide how many of those patients we've observed will be admitted within our eight hour window. If they've only just arrived, there's a, a lower chance that they would be admitted than if they've been here already for a period of time. Now, as we know, emergency departments have a target of admitting patients within four hours. Currently, that target is set at 76% 76, 76 of patients should be admitted or discharged within four hours of arrival. If we were, used to his, if we were to use historic data to determine someone's likely duration in the emergency department before they were admitted, we might underestimate demand because, as most people know, A&E performance has deteriorated over recent years and many patients spend a lot longer than four hours or even eight hours waiting for admission or, in some cases, waiting for discharge. So we instead have chosen at UCLH to take an aspirational approach and to give the hospital the numbers as if the emergency department was, was fulfilling its four hour targets. And this chart just really illustrate, illustrates what I've said, which is that if we were to rely on historical patterns of how long it takes someone to be admitted, we would be observing periods of time where performance was not hitting the targets. So we want to flip this and instead give a sense of how many patients would truly be admitted within the next eight hours if the, the emergency department was performing as it should. So we do this by concocting a curve that looks like this. If you look at the four hour hours since submission, the red dot there, that on the y-axis maps to 76%. So we know that the, this target currently is uh, within four hours, 76% of people should be admitted. Uh, but it, and then at the beginning of this day, when you've just arrived, a bunch of things still need to happen. You need to be seen by a, a medic. You, there may be lab tests. Uh, there may be treatment. So at the beginning of the stay, or just after you've arrived, your probability of, a, of still being in the emergency department is very high. Your probability of admission uh, by that time is low. So we want that curve to, to sort of bend upwards towards the four hour mark. And then ultimately after that, we'd like everyone to be admitted. So that top part of the curve needs to trend towards one and we've ad we've permitted a kind of a one percent at 12 hours who may not yet have been admitted that allows us to kind of bend the curve um, towards the asymptote at one and we can read off this curve to get a probability at any time since someone arrived do we think they would still be in the department if the a and &E was performing as it should and so you can see that a someone's probability of being admitted within two hours is relatively low 10 percent but their probability of being admitted within eight hours should be high because we know that's how the targets are set. So we can read off that and see that their probability of being admitted within eight hours is 95%. We use this aspirational approach for the patients in the emergency department and those are factored into what I've shown here. Although if you think about it, given that these patients are already in, they should have a 95% 
probability of being admitted within eight hours if they've just arrived, they've already been here some time. So in fact, applying this aspirational approach to them doesn't make that much difference to the numbers I've shown. It will, however, matter for the patients yet to arrive. So let me move on to them and talk about how we model them. It's a simpler process. We're going to use the pattern of arrival rates by specialty in order to work out how many patients yet to arrive we would expect within our window. And then we're going to apply our asp aspirational approach uh, as, a, as before, and I'm, I'll show you how we do that. The data that we use uh, is relatively simple. So we just take past data on people's arrival times and which specialty they end up in. At UCLH, we also look at whether they're a child because our choice was to assume that anyone under the age of 18 will be admitted to a paediatric specialty, irrespective of what consult requests they might have had while they were in the emergency department. We assume if they're less than 18, they're destined for paediatrics. And if they're more than 18, we assume they are not. So we're only really modeling the, the surgical and the hemonc and the medical uh, destinations in the consults modeling that I showed earlier. And we could do this uh, without the specialty level details, but as I said earlier, this is not so actionable. If you know that a particular area of surgery is going to be under pressure, then you can focus efforts on trying to ease patient flow during that in that part of the hospital more in a focused way. Whereas when you know only know your demand across the whole hospital, it's not clear necessarily what actions to take. So let's look at the modeling of the arrival rates for the yet to arrive. So we divide the prediction window into a series of discrete intervals. I'm showing them as one hour here. And for each of those discrete intervals, we use historical data to work out how many patients per hour arrived in each of those intervals. Here I'm showing uh, on the chart on the left, I'm showing starting at 3.30 in the afternoon and then the seven intervals following that. And you can see that if you read the chart on the left, there is about one or 0.9 patients per hour arrive and are admitted to a medical specialty in the hour after 3.30 p.m. And it, over the course of the, after the rest of the afternoon and the evening, those numbers dwindle, as we know, because the sort of most um, voluminous number of presentations in an emergency department tends to happen in the sort of middle of the day to the afternoon. So then drilling into the 3.30 number, we can see we've got point an average of 0.9 patients per hour arriving and being admitted to medical specialties. And we can use that average in what's called a Poisson uh, distribution to work out what the probability of any number of arrivals is, because it might be one patient, but equally it could be zero. In fact, it's slightly more probable that it's zero, but it could be two, three or four. So again, we're getting a sense of the uncertainty around the distribution in the number of beds. So we calculate our rate of arrival for each of our discrete at, uh, time intervals of one hour in the window. Um, and then we apply our aspirational approach to predict how many of them will be admitted. So we read off as we did before. And if you think about it, if a patient uh, arrives shortly after the beginning of the window, then they should have quite a high probability of being admitted by the, by the end of the eight hour window. But if they arrive just before the end of an eight hour window, then they're gonna have a low probability of admission. So we can take those into account and apply them here. I've, sh I've just shown a few examples. Um, and combining those together, we can then generate a probability distribution as before. I've not shown the steps involved in combining these, the Poisson distribution with this other probability, uh, but the result is the same. We can then read off our curve and say, okay, in this case, there is a 90% probability of needing at least one bed for the yet to arrive patients and a 70% probability of needing two beds. So that gives us the numbers here. You can see in these predictions for the medical patients at that particular moment in time. So that concludes the kind of explanation of the modeling steps. I just have a couple of words to say about how you might evaluate these models. So we've used machine learning and there's well understood methods for evaluating machine learning output. One of the ones known is to look at a, a calibration plot, which is asking whether people generally with a low probability um, amongst those with low probability, are they are few of them admitted? And amongst those who are assigned a high probability, 
of admission. Are many of them admitted? And if that is the case, then the model is performing reasonably well. I've shown here some calibration plots for the five times of day. Uh, and then more conventionally in machine learning, there is a an area under the receiver operating curve, and we also look at log loss. So this gives us a sense of the machine learning element of the model, and, and we can check, for example, whether that performance drifts over time as we as we look at patterns of the input variables variables changing over time. When it comes to the aggregate predictions, because they're aspirational, we can't directly compare the number of, of admitted with the actual observed number admitted. So if you think about a snapshot, for example, here I've got a curve at the uh, probability distribution uh, on the left. Uh, that's for a given snapshot, and that was a prediction. That moment in time will be associated with an actual observed number of beds for the patients who were in at that snapshot. So we can compare this distribution with its observed number, and then we can do that over all snapshot times in all prediction moments in the test set and bring those together into something called a QQ plot, which essentially allows us to compare whether the predicted distributions were similar to the observed distributions over that test set. And that we can't do that with applying the time window element, the, the aspirational eight hour window, because we know that the emergency department is not actually turning patients around as the targets would wish they were. And so therefore we, can not, we can't evaluate our models precisely in the eight hour window by the number admitted, but we can at least look at this idea of kind of how many patients needed a bed at some point in the future, irrespective of how long it took them to be admitted. And a QQ plot will give us some sense of confidence in the distribution. Again, we're looking for a pattern which kind of broadly follows the Y equals X line. So to recap on my objectives for this webinar, I wanted to show you how we use electronic health record to create real-time predictions of emergency demand at UCLH. I hope I've given you some insight into what data you could use for this modeling, how you might think about transforming it into a suitable structure, what kind of modeling steps you might apply, and, and some ideas about how you could tune this to make it aspirational to reflect the four-hour targets. We, alongside this, are developing a Python package to show how you might implement this in code. And the idea of the package is to support you by moving some of the probability-based logic that I've been talking about outside your own code and data. So you would prepare your data in the snapshot structure that I've showed. You would still have some coding element yourself in Jupyter Notebooks and Python. Um, you and your, your data being input would generate predictions of the form that I've shown and the patient flow package would be there to do some of the stuff like the aspirational targets and the probability distributions so you don't have to code those yourselves. The packages work in progress and we are keen to sort of get your feedback on it so if you're interested in using the package then please do consider uh, letting us know how you get on. So here are some other things that people often ask about what it takes to implement a model like this. So one question is, what is a useful level to report at? We, at the very first stage of our work, we just output hospital-wide predictions of demand. Then we've moved to this breakdown by medicine, surg surgery, paediatric, etc., because it makes the output more actionable, as I said. And now with UCLH, we're looking at finer levels of granularity, uh, even down to within the medical specialties, which subspecialties are likely to be under pressure. What in your context, what is the best way to serve the predictions? We chose spreadsheets and by email, it was a pragmatic choice because that's how our users wanted to receive the information. There is a question about how you run the models. Do you have a platform to interrogate your data in real time and run an application with the output. I would say that even if you don't have that platform yet, a proof of concept where you show the principle of this modeling may be really useful for starting to show your operational colleagues the value of this kind of predictive work. It may start conversations which lead the hospital more down a, a route where they're more interested in using patient flow analytics in this way. Once deployed, you also have to think about how to support and maintain your models and think about model drift. So do you, would, would you put something in place 
to check that where the models will still perform if there's any drift in the data and is there someone who can keep them running for for technical problems and also if there are functional changes which require some some adjustment to the models so there is some resource associated with running these and we have done quite a bit of pro bono work supporting UCLH to keep the, the application up and running until they were at a point where they were ready to embrace the idea of internalizing it and bringing it in-house. Here are some suggestions of useful resources that you might consider. I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, there's a great book by Tom Monks from the University of Exeter, Python for Health Data Science, where he looks at how you use Python for some of these kind of operational modeling problems. And then here's a link to our patient flow Python package, which is work in progress. And look out for a webinar hosted by NHS PyCom, uh, where we'll be talking about that in more detail. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to hand over to questions now, which are going to be hosted by Matt Dre from the strategy unit. Thank you very much, Stella. Um, if anyone would like to raise their hand, you can do so by going to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and then clicking raise hand if you'd like to ask a direct question. Please. Otherwise, do tap into um, into the uh, into the chat and Zella will pick them up for you there. Okay, we'll start with the first one that's arrived. Um, you used 90%, 70%, which will always give low estimate of the requirements. Why this choice rather than say 90, 50, 10, which would better show the range of probable requirements? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think, so this is the sort of best case in a way that what we're showing um, to set this in the context of a very strained NHS um, where if you, if you put it out as too dramatic, um, I think, it doesn't necessarily uh, reach the, you know an audience in a good frame of mind. I so this it was the choice of our our users. Craig Wood is the person at UCLH who we've been most closely working with. When in our first iteration, and that's the one that's written written up in the Nature Digital Medicine paper, we had like a, a sort of um, temperature gauge where you could see all of the the bed number possible bed numbers and the, their probabilities. And I think it was just too complex to convey to a user group. They're not sophisticated users of probability. Uh, even the concept of trying to give them something with a probability attached to it was new. Um, and so this is a kind of compromise between trying to convey some element of uncertainty, not being too daunting in terms of big, big, big numbers being, being put out and uh, and you know their level of risk, you know their, their ability to take into account probability-based stuff. Hope that uh, answers the question. Um, Lovely, thank you, Zella. Uh, we have another question. This is from Jeff. Have you access to any other data such as ambulance, um, which could? Oh, I've lost the. Uh, there we go. Which could be useful for those on the way to ED. Yeah, I think that because uh, obviously if you come in by ambulance, by ambulance you've got a higher probability of admission already um, and we do have a rival method for once that once they've arrived so with that conveyancing side um, I guess the thing is that the you would you would support your anticipation of that forward looking yet to arrive and you could you could work some of that into the yet to arrive modeling I think and that could could really help the challenge is always can, can you get that data in real time as well and I think it's now feeding into the system control centers and the integrated care boards they are they are now becoming sort of ingesters of ambulance data so I, I definitely see things will move in that direction I actually I think London Ambulance Trust would be quite keen to work and have have us make more use of their data so yeah it's a good suggestion Fantastic. Okay, and the next question is um, from Seth. This is how intensive is the data cleaning process once you extract the raw EHR data? That is a good question. Um, the I spent a lot of time at the beginning um, 
sort of filtering through all the different lab requests and the lab orders and the, and the numerous different um, types of observations get, that get captured and recorded. So there is a big sort of, uh, body of data points that we could use. And I just honed it down in the first iterations into the sort of variables that would seem to be most predictive and useful. Um, so I think it's a, uh, it's possible to do this with very little and maybe that's a better way to think about it so what's the minimum data you could start with and how well is are your models performing so if you were to tackle your huge bank of data and say okay i want i want arrival method method i want patient age and i want their locations in the ed while i'm there yes you will have to clean the ed location data um, because that will definitely be messy the, the eds change their location data the names of locations, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I don't want to underestimate the, the data cleaning element. Uh, but I think don't be put off by that and maybe do it but kind of pragmatically. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I noticed a few people asking in the chat here about um, whether the recording will be made available and it will do that will be on uh, youtube with the link in, in the chat there um sounds like poor hamza had a fire alarm so uh <laughs> unlucky but it will be it will be up on youtube um another question um how does the model performance compare to the bed manager's own domain expertise and mm. estimates of how many beds might be needed mm. um yeah they their expertise i think is as sort of um at one level it's patient level they are brilliant at scanning patient notes and knowing whether a, an individual patient will need a bed or what type of bed they need but of course cognitively they can't uh, do that for every patient so the, the value here is in to some extent short circuiting their their sort of intr intrinsic knowledge of, on a patient by patient level um i think there is also a bit of kind of um in embedded knowledge in them in terms of do these numbers look right for today and what we know of what's you know, what's going on in the, in the emergency department so they they also have some hunches I think that you know they know that Monday's going to be better because generally there are lots of discharges on on Sundays and um, so that the on the discharges side the hospital beds will be empty and then they know patterns of demand during the day of sort of what types of injuries come in when um, or what type what types of illnesses um, so it's difficult to I can't give you a quantified answer to that question the fact that we've had such good engagement from them over such a long period of time I would I feel suggest that they do find this valuable I think there's also value in for them being able to quantify for colleagues in the rest of the hospital this the state of play and particularly as I said if you can go to an individual specialty and say your area is under pressure this today because of this and here are numbers um, that in addition to their own knowledge I think is is very very helpful. Great thank you Zella. Uh, we have a question here from Marcus. Uh, how do you deal with output bloat as you're generating constantly new files? How often do you run revalidations for model drift? So, for example, here we had our ED floor change, which would impact the model significantly. Um, bloat uh, is very much a factor of the engineering of the application, which I haven't spoken about. This is its in its third iteration. The first version was built in R. Um, the second version was built as part of a, um, a quite a sophisticated platform that was trying to do a bunch of other things as well and that one got very bloated with data um not just sort of you know outputs from the modeling process but just sort of data accumulated um so my i'm working with john gillam at uclh and ucl who is a software engineer who's designed something that's very actually very uh, light in terms of the sort of bloat issues you were talking about um, I'm definitely, I think it will be encouraging John to share with trust through interest in actually deploying this, how he's done it. I think he's, he's, what he's built is something that could be very easily transferred to another trust that wanted to adopt this with the right technical infrastructure. 
Um, the the other question was uh, change, changes to to modeling and, and evaluating. Um, we have not done enough model drift and evaluation. What we've done is respond when we knew that there were functional changes in the ED, we, we knew we needed to retrain the models. They, for example, they introduced a couple of new locations. Uh, obviously we need to make sure that those, those locations were reflected in our training set. So that would be a case of retraining. Um, but ideally there would be a routine approach to this and say every three months someone will be checking um, and that's something we'd like to work towards but as I said earlier it requires you know resource and someone whose job it is to do that. Fantastic thank you and we've got one final one um, unfortunately for Guillaume here uh, the zoom session only connected halfway through so sends apologies if already addressed. Um, I assume you used machine learning approaches for this work based on your nature paper do you have a sense of the additional value of using AI algorithms versus traditional approaches in this case? As in many cases, I've been finding that there is little additional value in terms of prediction accuracy when compared with standard approaches such as logistic regression. Yeah, so if you've seen our nature patient paper, you'll know that we compared uh, XGBoost with logistic regression and actually that stood up perfectly well. And I haven't really done any quantification quantified evaluation um, compared with that. But I think the real point is that there are so many different ways you could generate a probability of admission for a patient given something that you know about them at that moment in time. It doesn't have to be machine learning. I think the, the temptation to go into a sort of an artificial neural network and do something really highly sophisticated, I, I really understand why that's there. We've tried to be user-led and do the thing that was as accessible as possible to, to NHS analyst who wouldn't necessarily have had lots of background in those things. Um, so yeah, I, I think there's lots to do without needing to try and demonstrate those added value from machine learning. Um, not quite sure if that's reframing your question in a different way. Um, so, I, I've just real, I'm a real advocate for thinking what's going to work best for your users and then making the simplest thing that will gather their gain their attention. I, I guess there's one element of value in using machine learning is that they do like to talk about the fact they've got AI models. Um, and so that's, I think, part of the trust being wanting to be more sort of on the front foot and leading edge with um, claiming what it's doing with data. Um, and, you know, we've been nominated for HSJ Digital Awards because we've done stuff with AI. So there's a kind of presentational element to it, which is, I don't know if that's really what you were, you were thinking of, but I hope that answers your question. Um, thank you, Zella. There's um, a couple of other items that have come through in the chat. I'll hold on to those um, and I'll probably pass those on to you just for some responses um, after this. Um, yeah. Otherwise, we're now at time. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming along. And thank you very much, uh, Zella, for the, for the great, um, great presentation. As mentioned, this will appear on YouTube very shortly. Um, and I'll just pop another couple of links in the chat to the, uh, the website and to the Thanks. Slack. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much indeed. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you, Zella.